lesson, and we are going to uh, what I have called, I could have broke them out differently, but I just choose to call it part two of, of lesson 10. I could have made this a separate lesson of its own, but, but it's because I am, I am holding to that which was in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2, and where it says doctrine of baptisms. Say it with me, doctrine of baptisms. And to remind you of that, I'm just going to go ahead and read that verse. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, laying not again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So if you want to know where I'm heading next, you ought to be able to read the verse and figure out where I'm heading next. I'm going to laying on of hands next. Um, so tonight, we're going to do the second portion of that. We're going to talk about the baptism by spirit or spirit baptism. Pray for me. Pray that the will of God can be done. Pray that I could help feed you things of God. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. You are, you are such a perfect master great Savior, our great God, Jesus Christ. We love you. Pray that your hand would be upon us. Guide us, direct us, <clears throat> physically give me the help and the strength that I need. Help me mentally that I could feed your saints, feed them of the things of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen and amen. So, a little recap real quick here. Uh, note, note that it is baptisms for anybody that wasn't here uh, last Wednesday night it's not a singular word it's plural because it is baptisms and uh, someone would try to figure out how do you make baptisms how do you make that plural whenever you're, you know, you're only baptized in water but you also have a spirit baptism and, uh, and that is proven and shown by what Jesus, what, what John the Baptist said about Jesus when he said in Luke 3, uh, 3 and 16, you get the same thing in, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 3. But in Luke 3 and 16, G John answered and said unto them, uh, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latch of his shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Somebody shout fire. Never understood people that got the Holy Ghost and was so pious about it. When I got the Holy Ghost, it changed me. Something got burnt out of me. Amen. Now, so... Here's where I want to begin tonight. We're going to be talking about spirit baptism. And so here's where I want to begin tonight. While out, water baptism is an outward thing, and I say outward because water affects our flesh. It affects our outward body. It can be performed by a man, a man, a woman. I'm not getting into a gender thing tonight, but it, there's not a third one, by the way. Uh, but a man or woman can baptize you in Jesus' name. They can perform that act. But when it comes to spirit baptism, it's a matter of the inside, not the outside. So it is an inward baptism. Spirit baptism can only be performed by God. I do understand that some people have tried to teach people how to speak in tongues and there's nothing I hate more than a false prophet or a fake experience. And you, you don't want to fake it to make it. You want to have the genuine act of God inside of your life. And uh, this is too crucial, too critical of a thing to play games with. As a matter of fact, you ought to fear doing anything like that. I don't even like play in church. I have too much respect for the house of God, the things of God, to even play church. And um, I, I, even back in college, when we would have our little skits, I, that's one thing I was never comfortable about. It's because the things of God are not something just to laugh and cut up about. 
Amen. But one more thing that I want to say about the spirit baptism is this, and I want to make sure that you understand me clearly when I say this, that without faith, the first act is an empty act. Water baptism without faith, you're just getting wet. Okay? And without faith, the second, the spirit baptism, is impossible. You will not receive the Holy Ghost if you do not have faith that God will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cannot tell you how many times in traveling, evangelizing, that we would help somebody that been seeking for the Holy Ghost for a long time, ask them questions like, do you believe that you're going to receive the Holy Ghost or that the Holy Ghost is for you? Many times their condemnation would make them feel like, no, I don't deserve it. I, you know, I've done so many bad things. If you don't believe you're going to get the Holy Ghost, it won't happen. You've got to have faith. And if you have faith, it's going to take place. Just absolutely it's going to take place. So I wanted to make those statements, tell you that, and make it clear. Now let's go into a little terminology because there's a lot of language, a lot of terminology, and some people can be so divisive that they try to make things, split hairs, nuances where it's not meant to be split. I, I, you know, I've taught, done some of this in teaching uh, on the subject of sin. I talked to you sin, transgression, and iniquity, different words. But in this case, what we're going to talk about is we're going to show how they're not separate and distinct things, but they're all one and the same. The book of Acts describes the baptism of the Spirit in many ways. It talks about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 4 talks about the promise of the Holy Ghost in 2 and 33, the gift of the Holy Ghost in 2 and 38. The Holy Ghost fell on them. Uh, chapter 10, verse 44 uh, it was poured out of the gift of the Holy Ghost in chapter 10, verse 45. They received the Holy Ghost in 1047. The Holy Ghost came upon them in chapter 19, verse 6. And then you go into the epistles and you'll see that the Holy Ghost dwells in us. In Romans chapter 8, we're going to get back to that verse in a little bit. Uh, those things were taken directly out of a book by Brother Bernard. And so I give credit to him for, for those statements. But you'll see how there's, it's said in different ways. Whether it's called the Spirit of God, whether it's called the Holy Spirit, or whether it's called the Holy Ghost. They are all the one and the same. Okay? Some churches nowadays, because they, they use uh, other translations, there's, there's a move in many of the Bible translations to get away from the word ghost because supposedly the word ghost has a negative fear factor connected to it. It's never bothered me because it's not a, it's not a, it's not a ugly ghost. It's a holy ghost. Personally, I, I prefer, prefer, Sis, you're going to have to keep up for me back there. I'm not doing this good. I prefer the term the Holy Ghost, and it's for one reason that I prefer using it. The word ghost literally means the spirit of the departed one. Not two, not three. <laughs> the spirit of the departed one. Jesus was the one that departed, and he made it clear, I'm coming back. I'm, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I am coming back to you. And so when we talk about the Holy Ghost, we understand it's the, pre the spirit of Jesus Christ living and dwelling inside of our, our souls. And thank God for that. Now let's cover a couple of Old Testament prophecies <clears throat> before we go further on into this. Uh, most notable is that spoken by the prophet Joel in, in the book of Joel, and there's no question that Acts chapter 2 is the fulfillment of that prophecy because Peter related to it. Just like in the Psalms, there's a little header on many of the Psalms that David will say, this was written during this period of my life. Uh, written in the cave of Machpelah or whatever like that. And so we can trace it back 
to the story in the book of Samuel and find out what David was going through and what his response to that activity was. And we know we can connect the two because of that. Well, this is one of those cases where it's undeniable that what Joel prophesied is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And it shall come to pass in the last days, or excuse, afterwards, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Aren't you glad it wasn't just a men thing? Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And then on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was fallen, and they acted like the people thought they were all drunk, Peter got up and began to preach and said, this was, they're not drunk like you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he went on to explain to them the experience that these people had and went on to preach to them Jesus Christ and their responsibility along with that. And uh, what a convicting message that it was. Isaiah prophesied about the Holy Ghost when he referred to it as a rest. Uh, now, let me just stop and tell you that tonight, as I, as I studied this out, I got to page six on my notes, my notes, and I decided it's time to quit because the subject is huge. It is, it is in, in theology, it's referred to the study of pneumology, and uh, it is meant the study of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, and in doing that, it could take books to complete the study of this experience because this experience not only is the initial experience, but if we really gave it the study that we should, we're talking about the power that comes along with that experience. And, if, and along with that comes the power to do what we cannot do. Mm, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right now, feeling the witness of his spirit right now. Because when we begin to talk about this, Pentecostals, we talk about the fact that we have gifts that have been given to us through the Holy Ghost that the other churches out there can't operate in like we operate in because they know nothing about the experience that we have. We have tremendous privileges uh, gifts and miracles that can be done because of the power of the Holy Ghost. And so there's so much that can be said, but we have, to, we have to tie it down. But one thing along with that is that the experience of the infilling of the Holy Ghost is a rest. It is our Sabbath. Now, let me, let me just do a little insert teaching here that, that doesn't necessarily, because it's not in my notes, but it fits. So, how many of you keep a Sabbath day? I'm talking about a day of the week. I'm not trying to put a condemnation on you, make you run to the altar. But I'll be honest with you, a lot of us physically, physically do not take time to rest. Now, I am not preaching, teaching, espousing that there is one day holier than the other days. We know that... that uh, in the New Testament, that all is done away with. But it does not violate the fact that there was a principle that was established that your bodies was not meant to operate seven days a week on, on the work schedule that us busy Americans give it. We need a day of rest physically. You need a time to rest. Wives, let him have a break. Men, you don't have to make her cook every day of the week. You can go out to eat. I had one man help me on that. Not a one, not one of you ladies said, hey, well, can't believe you didn't run the aisles on that. You, we all need a break somewhere and sometime. But that doesn't necessarily give this old active mind a break. Even if we do rest our bodies we still have all of this. Well, let me tell you something. Then the Holy Ghost. 
We have joy unspeakable and full of glory. In the Holy Ghost, we have a peace that it passes all understanding. In the Holy Ghost, we have, we have joy that they cannot comprehend. And it is a rest. Where with, you don't have to pay a psychiatrist bill. You don't have to go to the psychologist and figure out what's wrong with you. You don't have to do all of that. You can bring your cares to the altar and leave them there because he careth for you. I, I, he is the prince of peace. He is the comforter. Mm, somebody help me because that's, that's who my Jesus is. And when you fall in love with Jesus like you ought to and he becomes your everything, there's just a godly contentment that gets a hold of you. And um, you, you, so there's a rest that can come to the people of God. Isaiah prophesied about it, chapter 28. And uh, verse 11 and 12, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. I really wished I could take a pen and scratch off that last part. But the fact of the matter is the Jews rejected their rest. They rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected, I know a portion of them did accept it, but as a whole, the Jewish people rejected, turned their back, and even crucified Jesus. And it said, yet they would not hear. And saying of God, if you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, enter into your rest. I'm almost off subject, but I think I'm in the Holy Ghost. Enter into the rest that you have the privilege of. It'd be a sad thing for you to have the Holy Ghost and not have rest. I think I'll run the aisles. If I keep dieting, I might be able to get to it one of these days. Man, I looked up here at Brother Aaron and his coat just fit him so nice and I'm like, one of these days, I'm gonna get back there. Jeremiah talked about a new covenant. We call it the New Testament, uh, a new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You missed it. Because we just read the language and don't think about what we're reading. House of Judah, house of Israel. You have the divided nation, two, people, two nations, two tribes, ten tribes. But in that guise, guise of God, he said, I'm going to put it all back together again. <laughs> he said, I'm going to make a new covenant because we are spiritual Israel right now. Verse 33, jump, jump one verse and let's go to verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it upon their hearts or in their hearts and they will, and will be their God and they shall be my God people. It won't be laws that force them into it. It won't be somebody intimidating them into it. It won't be a pastor watching over your shoulder to see if you bite the right clothes. Somebody help me now. It's not because pastor's going to kick you out if you don't do all these things. Uh, yeah, I'd like to sometimes, but I'm going to tell you, that's not how God wants it to operate. It, this, is, this is not some cult that I have intimidate in, in powers to intimidate and manipulate. I don't want those things. I want you to love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your spirit to where the Holy Ghost will talk to you, prompt you, work on you, and you want to please God. It's not a fact of, of you wanting to get on the edge. It's a fact that God, I want to do everything I can because I'm in love with you. I want your approval. I want your acceptance. I don't want to try to please the world. I don't want to walk that way. The way of the transgressor is hard. I don't want to live the life of the transgressor. I want to live a life. Someone say, well, they might overshoot heaven. They go too far. I don't worry about that. It's not going to happen because I want you to know he's, he's waiting with arms open wide. Wow. I miss preaching on Sunday, but I'm feeling it tonight. I'm telling you, saints of God, it's going to be a joyful occasion when we get in the presence of our Lord. And we, we are his people, and he is our God. Let's talk about this phrase, the Holy Ghost and 
fire. Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus said, speaking of Jesus, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Interesting thing, I looked it up again tonight or today. Interesting thing in the Strong's is the word fire specifically refers to lightning. You think about it, how did man first get the invention of fire? When mankind was on this earth, how did fire come? Uh, They discovered fire because lightning hit and it put something on fire and they found out with that fire you could cook meat, you could do all these wonderful things, you could have a barbecue. And so they connected lightning with fire. But that's not the only connection to the concept of fire. It is a part of it. But the word is, is there because of a quick thing that happens. Did not the, did not the, it's in the book of Romans talk about, it's a quickening spirit. When, when, when the rapture takes place, the Holy Ghost that you have felt all over you. Aren't you glad you can feel the Holy Ghost inside of you? That, 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 that quickening spirit that we have an earnest of our inheritance. Oh, I feel like shouting tonight. When you begin to think about that, that, that feeling that you've had in a service or in prayer meeting or just during the day when you just stopped washing dishes and tell the Lord you love him and the Holy Ghost just moves all over you. Let me just tell you, when the rapture takes place, that is going to transform this mortal body in the immortality. We are going to be quickened and we're going to be taken out of this world. What operates inside of us right now is literally the quickening of the spirit of God. Somebody say, thank God for the fire. Now, I've never seen lightning be slow. I've seen it linger for a little bit, but it's, it's there and it's quick. Uh, it's interesting because on the report of the day of Pentecost, the Bible said they were all in one place in one accord and suddenly, somebody shout suddenly, there's a sudden occurrence that took place when the Holy Ghost fell upon them. Acts 2 and verse verse 3, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat down on upon each of them. Uh, and and when, I, when I break it down, when I go into it, when it says it sat down, it literally means that it hovered over them. Same terminology as in the beginning The world was out without form and void. And the Spirit of God, when it talks about the when 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 he when he hovered there, when he when he came to this world in the beginning, it was the same concept of a mother hen that is is over those eggs. Have you ever been amazed how a chicken that could wear several pounds can sit on top of eggs and never crush? delicate, fragile eggs. It's because she, she is sitting, but she's not fully sitting. She's there, but she is supporting her weight to provide protection and warmth and incubation and all of those things. When the Holy Ghost hovered on us, when the Holy Ghost fell upon us, when the Holy Ghost fell upon this world in the beginning, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over. It was a protection, saints of God. You're not hearing me. I'm telling you, it was a protection that was over us. There was an incubation that was going on because God was birthing something inside of us. Mm-hmm. When the tabernacle in the wilderness was first established, they built that altar of sacrifice. They laid out the wood. They put the animal on top of it. They did all of those things. But the priest did not ignite the fire. They didn't go put some flint together. They didn't take a rod and, and, and a bow and, and some dry moss and, and rub it together and do their Boy Scout thing. You know what happened? Fire fell from heaven. Leviticus 9 and chapter 24, and there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed 
upon the altar and the burnt offering and the fat, and which then when all the people saw, they shouted and they fell on their face. When God approved of the of the tabernacle, when God approved of the sacrifice, think of the typology resonant in this verse. When he did that, the fire fell and it burnt up the sacrifice. It consumed it. It purified it. Saints of God, when we present our bodies to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, the fire is going to fall. I said the fire will fall and when it burns inside of you, it will burn out things of the flesh that is not needed inside. let Let me remind you, while it's a marvelous thing that the fire falls, it's the priest's duty to preserve the fire because God did not do that every day when they laid the fire. It was their job to keep it going. He'd warned them about this three chapters prior to the event that I read to you about. Leviticus 6 and verse 13. And the fire shall be ever burning on the altar. It shall never go out. Makes me want to start singing that song that we sing around here. I hadn't sung for a while, but uh, what, what is it? The, huh? Huh? Let the fire on the altar never burn out, never go out. Uh, We've got to make sure it it stays on fire, saints of God. You cannot let it go out. I said you can't let it go out. Yes, it's partly my duty, my job, our job up here on the platform to help you just get into the atmosphere and the spirit. But I can't lay your sacrifice and I cannot do it for you. You're going to have to make up your mind. I am going to worship. I'm going to put fuel on it. I'm going to continue on in what I once received. Anybody thankful for the experience of the Holy Ghost? Keep it alive. Keep it fed. Keep the fires burning inside of your life. Let's talk about the promise of the Father. First mention of this was found in Matthew 7 and 11, Luke 11 and 13. I'm going to use the rendition that Luke read or said, but ye then, being evil... Now, that that doesn't mean demonic, okay? In this particular time, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It's just you're not perfect like God's perfect. And you're not good like God's good. And everything that we attempt to do, it's so much less than what God is. But we're just men, okay? We're just people. And if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. God wants to fill all the people in Dinuba with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He really does. He He wants revival to hit this world. It's the will of God that every man be saved. So it's his desire to give the glorious gift of the Holy Ghost to those that ask him. Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. That's your next word, Samaritan woman. And uh, he told her about that gift. I've got to trim it so I don't cover the whole story. John 4 and verse 10, Jesus answered, said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, give me to drink, thou would, you would have asked of him and he would have given thee living Water. We're talking about this gift that was the same gift that we talked about in Luke as being the gift of the Father. Amen? Now, we know specifically that, uh, that this was about the refreshing Spirit of God, presence of God indwelling inside of us because of what John, Jesus said in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, 
let's go over there, 7 verse 34, 37. The last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. John's using the same language that he used three chapters before. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said. You cannot make up your own mind what bits and parts of salvation you want to do. This is not a Lego religion. It's not a build it as you want it kind of situation. Just pick and select as you go. I'm sad to say, but there's too many people that that's their attitude towards God. Well, I just don't feel like that's, no, if you're going to take it, take the whole roll. If you're going to take it, eat the whole thing. Clean your plate. <laughs> Finish the whole thing. All right, let's, let's go. So if you, if you do it as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, artesian water, water that is alive. In other words, it's not stagnant. It's not in a bucket sitting there by itself. There's a flow in and a flow out. It's just, you can't help it. It's just overflowing. Verse 39, but this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. We could talk about that, but you understand we don't have time because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This is why he told Mary, don't touch me. I've, I've, I've been risen, but I haven't ascended and been glorified. And uh, after he did that, he came back again. There was not just one ascension. There was, there was one that doesn't get talked about a lot, but he ascended up into the heavenlies and, uh, and, and did the things that Hebrews talks about as our precious high priest, uh, the great high priest. Anyway, let's go on. In the upper room. Somebody shout glory. In the upper room. During the Last Supper, now this is not during the upper room when they received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, but this was the Last Supper. Jesus was preparing the disciples uh, for his crucifixion, the end days, everything that was going to come. Peter's refusing to believe it. Disciples basically are saying, no, no, Jesus. But uh, he's trying to let them know this is what's about to happen. And, um, and I like the verse that precedes the promise because Every good promise in the word of God is, predi it is predicated, it's, it's, is based on a previous commitment. You cannot take away obedience from the promises of God. I'm going to go ahead and say it, but this charismatic religion that is out there, this grab it and blab it and, or blab it and grab it stuff. They want the promises without the righteous acts. And you can't get one without the other. You've got to make sure that you live for God the way he wants you to live. So anyway, let's let the scripture speak for itself. John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's no two ways about it. Well, I love you, but I just can't do all that stuff. No, you don't love him. You say that, it's, it's words out of your mouth, but it's not in your heart. Because if you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And the Trinitarians go, stop right there and say, see, you got the Father, you got the Son, you got the Holy Ghost. You got three persons. Just read on. Don't stop. I confess, as I was working on this, I was having a difficult time as I would read through these passages because there's so many good scriptures. How do you trim some of them out to, for, the, for the sake of time? So let's keep on reading. Verse, verse 17, even the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you. Did he not sit there and look at, uh, look at Pilate and say and tell him, uh, I am truth. He is the truth. <coughs> 
He said he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I, I, somebody shout I. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The promise of the Father is that the Holy Ghost is going to dwell in us. But Jesus made it clear that comforter that is going to come, that's me dwelling inside of you. Later, Jesus specifically called this comforter the Holy Ghost. John, same chapter, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 26. But the comforter, the whole chapter is good, folks. Read the whole thing. Uh, The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so he lets them know this is what's going to happen. And uh, the Father's going to send it. It's going to be in my name, but it's me dwelling inside of you. So Luke writes down, prophesies the location of the first outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to read two verses, one in Luke and one in Acts. But in case you've forgotten it, Luke is the author of both the, the, the book bearing his name and also the book of Acts. Luke wrote both books. So Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye, what does the word tarry mean? Wait. Wait in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now jump over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he makes it very clear. The promise of the Father is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It's that Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. And then... Then after he ascended, what was it, about 12 days after that, they went to Jerusalem. They had spent time in Jerusalem in this place referred to as the upper room, which was more than likely a place where one of his many disciples, not just the 12, but the others that followed after him, uh, <clears throat> fairly, apparently a fairly well-off uh, person in Jerusalem, let them sp- stay and dwell in this room. And... Um, and this is where it happened. So they, uh, they were not all on their knees praying. There's been much made out of this. It really doesn't matter whether you're standing, sitting, kneeling, laying on the floor, driving a car. I've even heard them getting the Holy Ghost in the shower. Now, I don't really recommend that one for uh, a doctrine, okay? Let's not go there. But it doesn't matter where you're at. When you're ready... When you're ready, the Holy Ghost is going to fall. But oh, the beauty of this language. I hope it never gets tiresome to us. Acts 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in uh, one accord in one place. And suddenly, I can, I can just imagine that lightning power of God. <laughs> falling on them. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. How many of you had that experience take place? It's an undeniable spiritual experience when you know that your tongue that has not learned that language is speaking in a language that, that is beyond your capacity, your ability. Oh, the marvelous power of God. And I wish, 
I got something in my eye. I wish that we could be in some of those other countries and hear them speak in our language as they don't know our language, but they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All I can say is it's real, it's real, I know it's real. This Pentecostal uh, power, it's, it's real, saints of God. It is real. Now, let me, let, there have been times in history where people have received the Holy Ghost and people have seen signs such as fire visually sitting upon people. But there's only one time in the scriptures that I can recall that it states that. So we do not make a visible, physical proof of the Holy Ghost, that which is a physical fire as it dances on everybody's head. Okay, because you cannot make doctrines off of, off of a solo scripture. The scripture says it's not for private interpretation. In other words, you can't make doctrines on a solo spot. So what was it? It was this power. It's this sudden, this, this falling inside of us. But I'll tell you what is a consistent sign. And that is as you speak in tongues, as the spirit of God gives the utterance. I'm not going to go into that tonight because, as you can tell, my voice is failing. And uh, so I'm just going to read one more verse of Scripture, and we're going to close it out for this evening. And that is in Romans chapter 8 and verse 8 and 9. I want to make a very clear declaration that it is absolutely essential for your salvation to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you have not received the Holy Ghost, you're not fully born of the water and of the spirit. Still remember, Ice Cream Social, El Sobrani, California, somewhere around September 1974, I had received the Holy Ghost on a Wednesday night. It's actually a quartet singing there that night. And uh, <clears throat> I'd received the Holy Ghost. Sister Johnson came up to me on Saturday and she said, she said, when were you baptized? And I said, I've never been baptized. And the most horrific look came on her face. She was just horrified. She said, well, Ron, you're only half born. That's a horrible look. I mean, you just don't want to be half born. You want to be fully born, either in the womb or out of the womb, one of the two. Just don't get stuck in between, okay? And so we rectified that. The next day I was baptized in that lovely name of Jesus but you've got to have the Holy Ghost. Romans 8, verse 8. So when they that, are of the they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot do this on your own. This is not a mental exercise. Well, I believed Christ for my personal Savior. That is, that's a good beginning, but it is not the fullness of the new birth. You've got to have the full thing because in your flesh, you cannot do this. And again, the opposite is true. Paul talked about it. How can you finish in the flesh what was began in the spirit? You've got to finish it. You've got to live in the Holy Ghost, in the spirit. So verse nine, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be it, that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, watch what Paul declares. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's not that we want to condemn anybody. It's not that we want to downplay anybody's experiences. Hello? I, I am thankful for anybody that has a God consciousness. I just want to bring them along further. I want them to have the fullness of the revelation of the mighty God in Christ Jesus. I want them to know the full power that is available to them and how that they cannot serve God in the flesh. They've got to do it through the spirit and they don't have to do it on their own. They, they, we have the availability of the Holy Ghost to dwell inside of us. So saints of God, please hear me. Don't receive the Holy Ghost. Have this experience and then drop right back down into this, this worldly stuff. 
Don't try to live in this world and try to be spiritual at the same time. Just completely pour yourself out. Live for God. Love God. Give yourself to the things of God. The only way to make living for God easy is as you give your everything to it. Because if you live for God easy, it's going to be hard. But if you live for God hard, it's going to be it's going to be easy. It's one of those spiritual paradoxes. But oh, how much reality is inside of it. Everybody say, God bless Brother Bodie's voice. Keep me in prayer. It's coming back. But man, it was worth it getting to teach tonight. I love the word of God, saints. I love the word of the Lord. I love this apostolic doctrine. I love this apostolic doctrine. God, help us to infect our world. Help us to turn our city upside down for Jesus Christ. Let's just praise him for a moment. Come on. Praise him for a moment. Love him and lift your voice. Lift your voice to him. God, we exalt you. We magnify you. We glorify you tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on. Shout unto the Lord. There's a shout inside of us. Come on, shout unto the Lord. (laughs) Praise God. Amen, amen. Don't you feel blessed being one of his chosen ones? He could have chose anybody, but he chose me. I wasn't a whole lot to look at, but oh, thank God he loved me. Amen. He loved me like I was, but he didn't expect me to stay who I was. He loved me because what he saw, what I was going to be. Amen. God bless you. Fellowship. Love one another. Encourage each other. Live for God. In Jesus' name. And you're dismissed tonight.